Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here at this uh, juncture in time. While a lot of the discussion today was concentrated on uh, policy, on the role of uh, the main actors in the world, I would like to return a little bit on the science as it is being constructed, and in particular to look at the impact of international science cooperation on global security in general. So even, I'm sorry, there is this thing in the middle. I would like to return on something which I would call uh, a perfect example of what science diplomacy has been able to achieve in the last uh, decades, which is the, we were talking this morning about climate change, and I think uh, climate change may have an influence on uh, global security that is uh, uh, still to be uh, uh, well analyzed and, and reflected upon. But just to, to, to observe that science, in that particular case, were able to convince uh, politicians from here, 195 uh, countries, uh, and that uh, for, the, for the sake of climate and basically for being able to predict what the future can look like uh, based on the uh, evidence base of science, and that is a fantastic uh, uh, science uh, diplomatic uh, uh, result. However, when this kind of uh, crystallization has been able to take place, it doesn't last so long. And uh, I remember during this negotiation, one uh, observant who said that if the politician I understood what it meant to sign for the Paris Agreement, they would have never signed it. And a few years later, last year, 2018, um, I, everybody was still uh, rejoicing, and you can see the chairman was still <coughs> dancing on the, on, the, uh, on the tables. But the reality is not that positive. The reality is that the ministers refused to support the report from the, from the scientists because the implication from an economical and political uh, dimension were uh, too big for them to commit to anything. Uh, so, as a result, one could say that with this big uh, victory of science diplomacy, uh, science is again returning to its natural uh, position and, and not necessarily being supported by the political system. However, I would like to insist on the fact that uh, an organization, very loose organization from the bottom up, uh, with uh, this uh, organizing principle that they are convinced about the, the, the risk that are associated to the climate change is being crystallized here with uh, uh, this young uh, uh, Swedish lady, Greta Thunberg, uh, who basically delivered this uh, very interesting message to the politician, which I quoted here and that you can all and read and you know, but uh, basically it's to say to the politician, uh, solve a crisis without, you cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. And, and again, without any organization uh, really at the bottom up, this lit young lady uh, who is being nominated for Peace Nobel Prize today uh, is, has generated this movement which is called Fridays for Future, which has been followed all over the world and started in Belgium, and then in France, in Germany, everywhere really. Uh, maybe not so much in the United States, I have to admit. Uh, and then basically the message is listen to science, absorb this finding, figure out the mathematics, solve the equation, etc. And you have a short time to solve the problem. So while science was decreasing in its uh, influence at the political level, it's the, the civil society that has been gearing up to try to, to solve this. And uh, why maybe this? It's because everybody is now uh, well aware that climate change is going to stay with us for a long time, that the CO2 concentration continues to rise, there is no reason why it should drop, that the temperature rises, the ocean, the ocean is expanding, the risk of, risk of abrupt uh, climate uh, event is being, is being real. And, and everybody can see that uh, the result of this extreme weather, I cite here 
the Pacific hurricanes last year with the movement of three million people in China, uh, the polar vortex that is uh, very well uh, commented in, into the United States right now, but which is really the, the fact that the Arctic uh, uh, protection that existed for so long and for which uh, uh, the, the, the Russian Academy had made the uh, year of the Arctic in the beginning of the year 2000, uh, this barrier is now broken into into pieces, uh, and and the last point, uh, which uh, is also a sort of is a point of international cooperation, is to try to analyze what is really up to, happening in the Antarctica, with the melting of very very large pieces of ice that could lead to a very large as well uh, increase of the ocean uh, that would threaten uh, most of the very large cities uh, that are uh, across the ocean. As you know the. There is uh, about 70% of the ec economic activity that is within 30 kilometers from the ocean uh, side. So it's a, it's a very big in economical impact. This being said, uh, we also have to be honest with, us, with ourselves and observe that the same level of uh, loose co co association but very strong principle behind is at work to try to uh, uh, oppose uh, the, sci the scientific uh, discoveries and the, the scientific result. All those groups that are uh, anti-nuclear, anti-vaccine, anti-science, and uh, the, um, pro promoting fake news, etc., are also uh, attacking very directly the possibility for the scientific message to be delivered and listened to and analyzed properly. Here I have put a presentation which, in my view, represents quite, a, quite a seriously what the threat is for us, which is the percentage of people disagreeing with the statement that vaccines are safe. You, all, you may know or may not know that uh, because of this anti-vaccine, measles vaccination has dropped uh, very much in the world and that there are today, uh, which was completely uh, unexpected, uh, hundreds of uh, young children who die because of not being vaccinated against measles when it could have been declared completely eradicated from the surface of the earth if the vaccination had continued. But you will see that the, the, the and I will single just out one country which is France which is extraordinary. More than 50% of the people in France disagree with the f statement that vaccines are safe. The country of Pasteur is now one of the countries that has the lowest uh, trust in vaccination. Of course, this is going to change, but uh, it is to show that uh, the impact of very small groups, but very uh, uh, hard, uh, uh, with hard principle behind it, how they can affect the overall population. So when you speak about big structure, etc., I want to insist on the fact that uh, this cascading system, this polarization system, sometimes comes out of loose organizations that are not really being uh, uh, not manipulated but directed by, by uh, big, big structure in general. So this is to be taken uh, and is important if you want to think in global security because this is a soft organization that can hardly be predicted and, and occur almost everywhere. So against this, what uh, I would like to underline is that even though there are groups that are anti-science, it is also true that science is still well supported by the governments, but also by uh, the private sector, but also by different kind of, of uh, sources uh, that helps the scientists to, to be able to work and deliver uh, their, their result. And I can only uh, second what uh, uh, Academician Ivanov said this morning. We cannot stop the voice of science. We need, as scientists, to get our part in the world and brought up our voices so that uh, the arguments of the scientists are not only to provide new theories and new technologies, etc., but also some uh, uh, analysis of the implication of those technologies and how they will affect uh, our population and the global security. Of course, there is an ambivalence in science that has been underlined this morning quite greatly, 
between uh, uh, the positive aspect of science and the negative aspect of science, and also the relationship towards these positive and negative uh, uh, aspects from the scientists themselves. And, and this is where the scientist uh, needs to, to work uh, very seriously and, and consider the ethical dimension of what their work and how they broadcast their messages uh, outside. I'm not saying that uh, we should not work for the military, far from me, but uh, we also need to be aware that the population, when they listen to the scientists, may have also this reaction towards what a scientist is saying. Since I'm coming from the European Union, I just want to uh, speak here just to mention, especially for people that are interested in the scientific dimension, the European Union uh, research program per se is integrated, but it's the largest one single program in the world. And so, and it is based here uh, on, on the fundamental values that are still at work in the European Union. This is an extract of the next uh, framework program called Horizon Europe from 2021 to 2026. So, and this model is based on shared values, democracy, human rights, gender equality, richness of diversity. Uh, I've just heard a um, uh, person from Cuba. Uh, I think it, for me it's reassuring to see that uh, a group like the European Union uh, promote diversity as its way for uh, continuing and being able to, uh, to be an example for the rest of the world. But also the EU recognized that there are threats today that affects its security. And as you, you mentioned yourself, terrorism, radicalism, cyber attack, cyber threats, etc., <coughs> are major concerns. So what, in my view, should be done in the scientific sphere and the military sphere to try to enhance uh, uh, global security, but fundamentally to continue to support the scientific state. It was, it was said this morning that all what we have was a building up on the uh, advance of sciences and therefore created uh, this concept of the scientific state in the 18th century. And that concept needs to be supported and maintained if we want to have a, a level playing field and we can talk with each other. And in my view, uh, in, the, in, the, in the civil sphere, it is very important, considering the, the, the difficulty that are in front of, of us, to establish no regret policies that are naturally uh, built up on evidence base. Uh, we have this word in, uh, in the European Union that it, we don't want policy based on the evidence for that, to support that policy, but we want evidence based science to support policies. In other words, it must come from the scientific observation to furnish the policies and not to adjust the result of science to support some policies that may be heal conceived. And in that regard, I would certainly militate for uh, ecological or uh, environmental regulations uh, at, at the international level that would be agreed by all of us. I would certainly consider that uh, it's it, the economy and the, the society itself has to transform fundamentally if we are uh, being serious about uh, tackling the climate change. And in particular, <laughs> okay, we're going to save energy, I suppose, now. And in particular, I would uh, mention that the circular economy and all what concerned waste management uh, and, uh, and things need to be uh, addressed much better. And uh, just to say that circular economy is a fundamental difference in terms of uh, economic uh, uh, management than uh, maybe an evolution about capitalism, but certainly something that is going to uh, uh, transform even the big companies, the environmental impact, etc., <laughs> etc. Et and the same for our lives as citizens. Uh, we will not be able to live the same way as we, we do today if we really go to our circular economy. But I don't want to engage in this. Energy policies, of course, and uh, we were speaking about renewable, but I would like to continue to mention that uh, there is no solution to the energy uh, system without nuclear in particular. So I think it has to be said and repeated. 
um, and also uh, we have to be practical and we cannot consider that oil, uh, uh, coal, etc. will be uh, uh, eliminated so rapidly. So we need to develop technologies that uh, be able to capture uh, the CO2 that is being emitted, uh, which is some, uh, an area that is not progressing rapidly enough. And finally, something that may help the population is to develop a system of insurance. It be from, from the state, it be from the private sector, so that we can face the reality that uh, our population will have to support in case of uh, a dramatic uh, uh, occurrence of hurricanes or increase of water, etc. Uh, in, this, in, the, in the military sphere, from my perspective, uh, I think we have to realize that the big blocks are, uh, in particular, uh, speaking about the EU, uh, the EU uh, has now uh, developing a defense research program for its member states in order to try to, to build up on the synergies that, uh, that uh, were uh, uh, linked to the development of the member states themselves, France, UK, and Germany, etc. And, and that they're, they're putting together a program to try to build up this European defense system. So it's, it cannot be underestimated. It may look like uh, something of no consequences, but uh, over the time it may turn out to be a very serious uh, 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 research program and which would have impact in what kind of technologies the military uh, will do in Europe and maybe to create this European defense that has been foreseen since the beginning of the European Union. As concerned as the, you, the US, you are uh, certainly uh, aware of the Comprehensive Threat Reduction Program that it is continuing, even though it was created uh, uh, in, the, in the 90s, it is continuing and is perceived as a vehicle for the United States to try to uh, share their views, creating alliances uh, at, the, at the level of researchers or organization in order to, uh, to, to feel protected against uh, what they consider to be threats. And finally, this little program that you may have heard of, which is uh, the Center of Excellences, where the EU also is trying to share in its multilateral approach uh, with certain regions of the world uh, the, the knowledge and uh, uh, about non-proliferation regimes and trying to uh, create an academic world that would uh, 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 diffuse this knowledge uh, locally. And uh, now, I, okay, I just wanted to, to talk about uh, the international science cooperation and to give you some example here. Um, International science cooperation has been uh, received a big boost after the end of World War II with the creation of the United Nations, um, with the creation of the United Nations agencies. You, you know better than me what they are and what they did uh, in the atomic energy, but also in the health organization, etc., etc. And, uh, and that has contributed to establishing uh, a good level field where people could talk could exchange information uh, and, and solve some of the problems before they could be uh, uh, raised to a level of a conflictual relationship. What the, 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 the role of the Atomic Energy Agency cannot be underestimated, even though it could not stop some, uh, some action in Iraq in particular. But they did their work and did their work very well. At the same time, the international cooperation brought people to work together on the infrastructures of very large magnitude, upon which I put some here. The first one on the left is called ITER, for which I have been uh, taking a, a direct uh, part into its creation. And, and that brings uh, all the big players in the world, uh, South, from, I start from South Korea, Japan, India, China, the Russian Federation, the European Union, and the USA. The majority funding coming from the European Union, and it is in the European Union. I would like also to mention this uh, CMS, which is a diagnostics that is in CERN on the Large Hydron Collider. And, and here, also because uh, we, when we worked with, uh, with Russia, we participated to push the laboratory 
to create the crystals, uh, lead business crystal that are in CMS and that has led to the, de to the discovery of the Higgs boson, so a beautiful scientific experiment based on the top knowledge technology and that is providing uh, this extraordinary result, but also the ISS that you know much better than me, and uh, this structure as well, which is called ALMA in the, in the Southern Hemisphere from the European Union, which also bring people together. Those are examples of international science cooperation with different sort of uh, uh, organization, governance, but also that brings together uh, the main players of the world and others. That I wanted to eliminate. And uh, so I can just jump on the next one, which is we've heard this morning that indeed uh, there are a uh, new evolution of science, a new revolution in science, which is linked to what I call the dataism, the increase of data and our capability of uh, being able to analyze the data. And um, of course, there are two dimensions here, which is the data, the quality of the data, how do you cure databases, the accumulation of data, which is enormous. Here is a graph from the OECD that shows um, how the data is, is increasing exponentially. And also, uh, something that was mentioned a little bit this morning is uh, the algorithms themselves. Uh, the algorithm needs to uh, not be uh, vulnerable to bias or unfairness. And when I hear, and I, I hear that this morning a little bit, that there is this concern about uh, artificial intelligence, but when I read and then I, I've talked with some of the people that are working directly on artificial intelligence, they don't have a concern about artificial intelligence wiping off the human being, etc. As was mentioned by an academician this morning, there has been uh, this kind of revolution in the past. There will be more in the future. Artificial intelligence will be used by the human beings to achieve the result that they, they really want to achieve. Um, just one thing that, uh, of course, if we go further into artificial intelligence, we will need much more computing power than we have today, even though we have very large computing power. And the development of quantum computing is certainly something that we need to foresee. Just in passing, um, it is true that artificial intelligence today is being mainly developed by the very large uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, America, like uh, Watson by IBM, together with uh, uh, big universities or big laboratories. Same thing for quantum uh, uh, computing. Uh, and then one of the center of Microsoft is in Denmark, uh, from which the speech is being taken. So it is true that it is the private sector that is pushing much more so far that uh, the governments are pushing, but still, if it was not from these infrastructures of the main laboratories, main universities, etc., worldwide, these advances in this quantum computing would not occur. And the same thing for artificial intelligence. If there were not laboratories in the academia, then this would not advance in the same way. So, just to mention in passing something from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is to say, if we go into artificial intelligence, we need to go much deeper than what we have done today and go to deep learning, so which is the, the core of artificial intelligence. Here is just a, a snapshot of some of the technologies and some of the approaches that deep learning could uh, uh, be uh, uh, focusing on for this particular uh, institute, national laboratory uh, in, in one of the United States. But you see that the sphere of security is, is already uh, con uh, considered and, and bring many different subjects of uh, deep learning, m showing, if, if need be, that artificial intelligence uh, will be very uh, important for the next phase of the development. And let me say something in passing. None of the big players that have been mentioned this morning can stay out. We all need to engage in artificial intelligence development. We all need to clean up the algorithm that are being used. It's a fantastic opportunity to try to get away from many of the hackers, of the geeks, or whatever they are being called, uh, that are putting a line of software that sometimes create uh, a difficulty for all of us. 
it's a, it's a very big opportunity for the academia to bring back, uh, to, to being listened and, and to be able to, to, to grab back uh, uh, this new development of uh, IT. And in that regard, uh, I think I want to say that academia is, uh, can play a very important role uh, because all the, the concerns, all the risk, etc., that are being broadcasted can be diffused by academia through knowledge, uh, can be presented in a way that can be better accepted by the population, better accepted by our students, uh, who will then be able themselves to, to present to their peer, to their parents, their family, to their friends, uh, the reality of what we are trying to achieve. I again want to insist that it is through this channel, very little sources, very little uh, group, that maybe we can uh, recover a position where science can be respected and can continue to uh, uh, make our society to evolve in the right di direction. And, and also the, the, the interest of academia is that, uh, in particular, the, the Russian Academy are the research infrastructure. It, it, nothing will be achieved even with the best computers if we don't have the research infrastructure, if we cannot advance the, the physics. You know, data are data that are being accumulated today. It's not uh, the new uh, theoretical concept that will be at work tomorrow. And this research infrastructure of different kind, with different financing, with different concept, etc., can be of an essential element for the future development of science and their contribution to the global security, considering the risk that we were mentioning before. There are strategic investments. And, uh, and it is important for the big players again, and the smaller ones as well, to really uh, put a direction there so that they have the infrastructure that will allow us to go to the next phase of the scientific discovery. I just want to mention a few infrastructure that I think are worth mentioning in the sense of uh, the beautiful uh, uh, result that they have been able to obtain. This is the Mikkelsen. Uh, that uh, has been uh, two Michelsons that, that were uh, built in, uh, in the US, which is called the experiment of LIGO, which demonstrated uh, the gravitational wave. I think uh, for all the people that have done physics and looked at uh, general relativity, this is a, a very exceptional uh, result and uh, showing what kind of detail and what kind of uh, measurements you must be able to, to do in order to, to see these kind of oscillations. I want also to mention something in terms of collaboration, international collaboration, that is contributing as well, which is the Large Hadron Collider grids, uh, which uh, is exchanging about 10 gigabytes per second. Uh, it's not nothing and has been 170 center, 41 countries involved, and two main grids, one in Europe and one in the US, so that uh, the whole scientific community can contribute and participate to the analysis that are necessary for advancing uh, uh, fundamental physics. Uh, and this is uh, uh, an excellent example of uh, what uh, CERN has been able to do. CERN truly international with a lot of contribution from Russia, from the European Union, from the others as well. A lot of scientists that can come and come back home to, to, uh, to make the analysis that are relevant and advance the, the result. I would also want to underline one uh, infrastructure which, uh, to which we different of us, we, we tried to contribute the good as we could, but that originated from an idea that was at CERN and, uh, um, uh, 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 and which was this idea that science can serve peace directly by putting infrastructure in areas of the world where, uh, which are close or in conflict since many, many years, and it was in the, in the Palestine region. And uh, uh, Maurice Jacob, whom I would like to, to salute here, uh, was the one at CERN that pushed for this idea that there were some secret synchrotron uh, equipment that were coming to be obsolete for some part in, in Europe. And those could be given so that to create a synchrotron 
in, in Jordan and bringing uh, uh, scientists from Israel, from Palestine and other uh, parts of the world to, to, to work together and to try to create this kind of uh, peaceful organization and it term, the term was called Sesame, of course, uh, for uh, cultural reason. And, and that is now uh, entering into operation. It's not the best synchrotron in the world that uh, we are clearly, it's a uh, third generation, so it's not the best one, but it allows people to work together uh, on, uh, around uh, an infrastructure. Infrastructure have the capacity to bring people from all over to work together, to share together, to become friends, uh, and to go back to their families without uh, um, with better information or better appreciation of what other uh, uh, members of different countries can bring to, to advancing science. And, uh, and this is a, a really a, a perfect, particular positive example, uh, even though it was very, very difficult to put together. Last form of international cooperation that I want to underline, because mm -hmm. yes, there are infrastructures, but in the modern world, there are also new methods that uh, with all people that have worked in international cooperation, we know the difficulty of launching a joint program where we put our forces together and then we have to finance um, uh, one program or one project. And the difficulty is that you multiply the complexity of the program from X and the complexity from the program from Y, and in the end, no project is being financed because it's, it's impossible. Uh, I've been in the Commission long enough to tell you that this, this is the, the very big difficulty. The new way to, to do these sort of things is to say, all right, let's agree a program of what we want to achieve. You have your project in Russia, we have our project in EU, they have their project in China, they have their project here and there, and we are going to share the results of this and, and create a system whereby it will be the results that will be the source of our cooperation, not the financing per se. So here is an example which is on rare diseases. A very soft organization, but all the members here which have been mentioned in this uh, graph are contributing the result of their, of their research in order to advance rare diseases. Just one thing on rare diseases, some, some people are saying that if uh, health continues as it is today, there will be only rare disease in the future because we are all different people. So at the end, it will be always personal and for yourself and others. Here on rare diseases, as they have been conceived here, the problem is very simple. Non one country can consider to solve the problem of one rare disease because the cohort, the number of people they have to engage into this, it's too small everywhere. So you need to do that glo globally and you need to take account of the variation that uh, are in Asia, here in Russia, in Europe, in South America, etc., etc., in Africa. And then with the, those results, we may be able to develop the medicine that will maybe cure if it can be done, of some of those rare diseases that are affecting our children in, in a way that is uh, uh, just terrible for the parents and for them. So, and, and this is just another way of collaborating together, of contributing to talk to each other, which is to bring whatever you have and then to share and to analyze the result together. I think it would go also in the way of what we, was being promoted this, this morning by Academician Ivanov, where we would bring our results, analyze the systems, and then draw some conclusion recommendation that could be taken by the United Nations or any other organization that would be willing to do so. So this leads me to my, to my conclusion. There are truly tension on the international scene that are brought by not only the terrorist system, but also by our way to manage the planet and, and by the evolution of our society model. This clearly affects the global security. They clearly affect the, the social risk and the unrest that could emerge in our societies in a 
more or less spontaneous manner. This is what I want to insist on. It is not necessarily something that is going to be organized from the big thinker, this and that, but maybe spontaneous. And, and that is, is where the risk lies. And I think that the advanced nations and other nations, they have to tackle those risks and, and, and by creating system where they develop confidence, trust building systems, as was originally foreseen in the United Nations. Science and the science cooperation in that regard is a fantastic tool to be able to address those things. It can promote new endeavors, tackle issues of social, social interest, um, combat effectively the security challenge by different technologies or different capacity to analyze things or to, to, to be pre preventive in their approach and uh, increase the trust and confidence. In that regard, I just want to say that the academies in general have, a, because of their network, because of the way they work uh, together or because of the way they work at home, have really a future in, in this kind of organization. And, uh, and I, I strictly support and strongly support the fact that the academies, in particular the Russian Academy, which has the possibility of having infrastructures, laboratories, institutes, etc., can, can be a voice that could be listened to uh, worldwide. With this, it will be the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.